So when Tim called from Cupertino, he was all worked up and excited and wanted to know when I would do the video. I said, what video? And he said, the video that you promised you'd do if the board agreed to name the new computer chip the Macro One, shorten it to M1. I told him I'd do it, and I mean it. I, I meant it when I said I'd do it, and I will do it. But he's picking the same week that Small Rig is putting out the new locking clamp system, the drop-in hawk lock. He has got a nerve. You'd think he owned the world, wouldn't you? Well, hang on. He actually probably does. This is a video on how the Macro One chip has helped my macro workflow, but it's really about the new small rig. You have got to see these clamps. These are Pro with a capital What's the first letter of Prod? Arlen? He said one of the things he overheard these people saying was that if you buy one of these tennis rackets from Harbor Freight, which is not really a tennis racket, it's an insect exploder. So this story reminds me a little bit of Jack and the Beanstalk, except there's no Jack or Beanstalk or Giant or anything else. But he overheard these chaps saying that if you buy one of these tennis rackets from Harbor Freight and take it apart, which he kindly did for me. Apparently, there's a way you can turn the insides of that tennis racket into a Tesla. And my brother has always wanted a car, so he brought it home and asked me if I would make this into a Tesla. Maybe I'll do a video of making that into a Tesla, but not today. Today, I'm going to show you exactly what happens to my stacking, retouching, and editing workflow when you throw in a brand new MacBook Pro M1 Max. If you've been thinking about taking the 10 core arm plunge, which actually sounds more like a Scandinavian adult art movie, watch this video. I think it'll be illustrative or illustrative or both. Before we start, thanks to my Patreon peeps. You guys are incredible and awesome, and thank you for all of your support. When I say none of this would be possible without my Patreon peeps, what I really mean to say is none of this would be possible without my Patreon peeps. Pretty straightforward, eh? But thank you. Thank you to everybody who supports me through Patreon or however you do it. For example, let me show you one cool way that you can support this channel. You can send me a Mitu Toyo 10X M Plan APO long working distance infinity corrected microscope objective. You can also throw in an ITL 200 tube lens and a medicine bottle that I've cut up to make an adapter so it fits in some old tubes. That part's pretty embarrassing, but the other part is not. Captain Martinez, thank you. We have got several videos coming up where I am gonna show you everything you need to know about these two incredible optics. There's a new video tripod coming out from Small Rig, and it's a beaut. I know that because I'm looking at it. But this is a teaser, so I can't show you, but it is, it's nice, it's really nice. If you're into video um, and you have something smaller than say a, an Arri or a, a Red, let's say you have a phone that you do, do your video on, you're gonna love this tripod. Then I'm gonna review these new clamps from the world's leading extreme macro shooting platform supplier and cool gadget maker, Small Rig. They have come out with a new kind of clamp that is uh, really revolutionary for macro photographers. This is the coolest uh, modular type of attaching device. Doesn't matter what kind of system you have for your macro, extreme macro in the studio, these things 
you're going to need. I'll show you all about how I'm using them with my microscope and uh, how I'm using them for videos as well as uh, still photography. Also, I am reviewing uh, the new USB-C G technology G drive, which is, in my opinion, a better solution than, than solid state when it comes to archiving photographs. So I'm going to be looking at their four terabyte drive and talking about that. Also, within the next few days, the first episode of a new video series. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time and have been working on very hard. I don't think there are any quite like it. It's a completely unique take on the DIY type thing in that my stuff usually doesn't work and the projects don't get finished and there's often people getting hurt in them, emotionally as well as physically. So it's that kind of uh, series that has very little to do with photography, except that the stuff I try to make is mostly related to photography because this is like real TV. This is a real thing that I do. It's called Projects to DIY For. It's funnier when you read it. In the words uh, of Mike Canfer, Oscar winner and special effects wizard, Hollywood insider, this is the best stuff the Walls brothers have done yet. The good looking one reminds me a lot of Leo from Titanic. If I had paid him, that's what he agreed to say if I paid him. And I didn't agree to pay him, so he didn't say it. That'll be out sometime this week, and I recommend you not miss it. It's going to be interesting. Shall we get going with today's uh, extravaganza? It's all going to be in the computer. I'm going to time what I do. I'm going to tell you what has changed for me in my workflow, but mostly we're just going to rip through a quick edit, retouch and cleanup job. Fair enough. What I've done is um, I've selected uh, this particular stack. It's the head of the ant that uh, I found and uh, I've got them all checked and that's the only one. I'm not importing uh, any of the other photographs from that session, just the one. So let's go ahead and import them. Hang on, let me turn on the stopwatch. All right, import. I hit the button and I press start. Uh, we're 26 seconds into it. Now, of course, I'm gonna count the DNG conversion as well. So we'll time that too. Well, okay, maybe it doesn't take, that was 56 seconds and it ejected the card. Um, now it's doing the conversion to DNG. That was pretty quick. Uh, I'll show you what I do and what I don't do before the, the stacking process, then we'll send them over and get them stacked. Uh, so we're halfway through the DNG conversion. We're at one minute and 48 seconds. There we go. I think the DNG conversion is done or it will when my name appears. Two minutes and 22 seconds. Okay, now that's impressive. I'll stop it now and uh, let's have a look. At the first and the last picture. Okay, that doesn't have anything in focus in it. I'm gonna remove this first grouping of about seven. I'll just right click on it, hit remove, and remove uh, delete from disk. Okay, let's look at the end and make sure that there's nothing there that we want to trim. Uh, nope, that's got stuff that's sharp that I want like limb roots and what have you. So everything else I want to keep. Now, pre-processing, one huge thing that has changed for me is um, I no longer crop ahead of time. I used to always crop if I thought I could make a smaller photograph and it would stack quicker. And it did stack a lot quicker. Uh, but now I don't because I'd rather, I'd rather figure it out at the end when I know what the stack is gonna look like. So there's no reason for me to crop it and guess what the, the final composition is gonna look like. I, I can just wait and it doesn't take any longer. Now, as far as pre-editing, well, you may remember some of my earlier videos where I did quite a bit of exposure um, correction at this stage. I no longer do that. And it's because I've learned a lot more about how uh, the the TIFF conversion works when when stacking programs are taking these pictures uh, over to be stacked. It tends to spread out the the um, histogram and exaggerate the dynamic range, and it tends to brighten highlights and darken shadows. The result is that you can end up with clipping, 
and uh, clipping, you know, is, is the loss of detail either at the uh, the high end or at the low end. And uh, if it's at the low end, it's not that big a deal. Losing detail in the highlights is a fatal error. I mean, I'm not going to publish a photograph that has a blown highlight. Now, in this particular case, when I look at this image at the end of the stack, I can see that there is some clipping in the green channel. So what I will do is I'll get rid of that. I will raise up the black point just a hair above the baseline. Almost not enough to see a real difference, uh, but I'm still keeping the histogram way bunched over to the left. Uh, this is a personal preference, but I recommend you give it a try because what you'll find is you have loads of room to correct for this later on, whereas if you have one blown hi highlight, you're done. Okay, let's send this over to um, Xerine, my stacker of choice. Export to Xerine stacker and start the stopwatch. It's 196 images. Okay, oh, we're done. Importing took two minutes and 31, and sending the images over to Xerine took one minute and 21. I believe in slabbing, and I'm not, this is not a slabbing video, uh, but because slabbing is such a, a crucial part of my workflow, and I do it in virtually every case, unless it's a very, very short, very, very simple stack, I do it because it makes retouching easier, faster and more effective, as you'll see. Uh, so I'm definitely gonna slab this. I would slab every 200 uh, image stack. It's, it just stands to reason. Uh, to do so, I hit batch, slabbing, uh, 200 images. Yeah, 13 is about right. Uh, that's my default setting. Sometimes I'll drop it to 10 for a short stack or increase it to 15 for a big one. Three, overlap is plenty. Always stack in Pmax, otherwise you end up stacking artifact. Uh, run all batches and close dialog. Oh, and start stopwatch. To save some time while, while we're waiting for this to happen, I'll talk about one of the things that is definitely going to come up, and that is uh, Halo. Uh, Halo, I don't, I don't really think of Halo as being an artifact per se. Uh, when you have a structure in front of another structure and you take a photograph of the one in the front. The one in the back is blurry and out of focus. If you move the focal point until the background is in sharp focus or the, the rear object is in sharp focus, the one in front doesn't just go away. It's still there. It's twice the size and it's all fuzzy and indistinct because it's so out of focus. But when you take the photograph of the sharp thing in the, back, uh, in the background, it's going to be all covered with the fuzzy stuff from uh, the, the object in front. And that's what Halo is. Halo is the photograph of the out of focus stuff in front of the in focus back background. So... Now we're already through with the alignment, and watch how fast now it's going to it's going to stack these uh, uh, sub stacks or slabs. It is endlessly fascinating for me to see how fast this goes on a real computer. There is no smoke coming out of my computer, and the fan hasn't started. What were we talking about? Halo. The halo is um, then an artifact in name only, and it doesn't, it's not supposed to go away with retouching. You're putting information from a Pmax image or a Pmax slab directly into your DMAP output image. So Halo is gonna be less obvious in a Pmax image, but it's still gonna be there because it is actually part of the photograph. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't be something that you can uh, just retouch away. But one of the things I want to take advantage of this time today to show you is that you actually can get rid of it and you should be trying to get rid of it. Uh, there's a, there's a, a technique or it's more of a mindset that I use and I teach is uh, to, to retouch on faith based on knowing that the Rit Littlefield is cleverer than I am. 
if, if you're retouching, as you should be, you should retouch every time you stack. Uh, and if you're retouching from the, the DMAP as your output and you're using Pmax images, when you see something funky like some transparency or if you have big halos, if you have any of that kind of stuff, try to retouch it, even though it, your brain says, well, retouching isn't going to get rid of that. Try it anyway, because you will find if you use the details brush, uh, which is the, the first brush and the default brush, you'll find things that you didn't think could be retouched away will go away. And that's one of the reasons um, I, I emphasize this step as so important in getting ready for Photoshop. If you don't do this, you can end up in Photoshop with a lot of artifact that can be very difficult to fix. Give it a try. If it doesn't work, you've lost nothing but a couple of seconds. In addition to actually retouching areas of clear abnormality, there's something else I do that, that most people, I think, probably don't do. And that is I, I pass the details brush over all edges, especially prominent edges where there's a contrasty change. Uh, it just seems to add definition and clarity to the picture. And I've been doing it for a long time now. But um, yeah, I, I have no, I can't justify it. I don't have any science secrets to why it should work, but it does. You'll see in just about two seconds, because believe it or not, the 200 image stack is now finished. Now we need to save these to one location, and we're gonna save them to the same location they came from. Click on the first and the last, go to File, Save Output Images, Save Image, and Save. Well, we're right at 13 minutes, so that was a, about a minute and a half. These have all now been saved. Let's bring them back into the Input File menu, which is where we're gonna stack them from. So go to File, Add Files. It'll open up the file that they're in, and it'll be at the bottom that you'll find them. There they are, all 20 of them. So you click on the last one and the first one, shift click on the first one, and just hit open. That brings them into this stack right here. Click on the first one, click on the last one, um, shift click on the last one, and then go to stack, stack selected, Pmax, and then hold on to something so that you don't get blown out of your office window by how fast this uh, thing stacks. Now we're gonna do DMAP, stack, stack selected, DMAP, and start. Five seconds, nine. Okay, we're halfway at 16 seconds. Um, what I do is I move the slider until this happens. It gets dark and dark and dark and then a little bit of dark appears on the subject. And if you go a bit further, everything goes dark. Back off to where it just starts to appear black. Click OK. We're, it's, it's almost done. And we're at 47 seconds. Even with my talking, that was under 50 seconds to do the DMAP. So we're done with the stacking. This is our uh, DMAP output, and this is our PMAX output. PMAX uh, has a tendency to uh, sharpen the image, spread out the dynamic range. It's great for detail. It's great for getting good definition of crossing subjects, and you don't, uh, don't see a lot of artifact. DMAP, on the other hand, is much better for color and texture and natural, uh, it's the good looking part of the photograph. What it's not very good at is crossing stuff and detail. So we need both, you always, always need both. And the way you mix the good parts from both is to go to edit, start retouching. Always be on the uh, DMAP when you, when you do that so that the DMAP is the, what we retouch to from the other photograph. So this is the DMAP. We're gonna make a big window of it. Now, instead of going through the, uh, the individual slabs, we might not need to. Why don't we start by looking at the Pmax, which is the one that's got all the detail. And then by hitting the option key, I can see it. So what I'm doing is I'm, uh, 
uh, I've got the the uh, image covered up by the target image and when I press the button I can see what it reveals. So here is what I I recommend that you do. You get your regular oh check that you're on the right brush. You wouldn't want to be painting all over the place with the darken brush. Grab the details brush and start going around the edges with paying a particular attention to wherever you see things like that little that may just be reflection off the background or it may be artifact that is halo see it you'll see halo whenever something is in front of something else this is halo around here and this is transparency artifact and all of this can be fixed so I don't do it just jumping all over the place. I start usually in the bottom left-hand corner and I work my way around. And even though there's no artifact here, I usually paint the edge because it, I'll catch stuff that I didn't even realize was artifact sometimes. Now, pay attention to what happens when I paint this brush over things. You might not have thought that was artifact, but look how sharp those hairs are now. Same here. Oh, look, the transparency disappeared. This will make you a believer in stacking, uh, in slabbing, I beg your pardon, and routinely retouching. Because you'll see, even though you might not see any artifact in some of these areas, it's going to get better. Okay. Enough enough talk let's zoom out just a bit all right so i'm going to go keep going around the way i was okay more artifact just disappeared that there you go artifact along the top of his thorax this is his thorax back here let's uh one thing that it won't get rid of is foreign bodies we're gonna have to remove that piece of lint or cotton so i'm not going to the interior unless I absolutely have a reason to, because remember, it's the color and the texture that I want to keep, and it's the edges I want to fix. This is going to be the, the most interesting area down here, because there's stuff to improve. This is artifact, even though it's faint. No, it's not. Okay. Well, it looked like it. See the transparency here? You can see the edge of the limb underneath the mandible. Look at the detail on this mandible. Is that beautiful or what? Okay, now this is not getting rid of that. Tells me one of two things. It's either a reflection of the blue background or maybe the darken brush would do better. Mm. I, I can either treat that as a reflection or when we go over to Photoshop because I'm going to have to clone stamp that out. Uh, we'll we'll fix it there. So let's go back. Always go back to the default brush when you're through using a specialty brush. See the halo all around here? This is what we need to get rid of. This is what these tools do that certain other stacking programs that profess to be able to do this do not do this. They say they do. They do not do it. And I just tried once again the new beta and they just don't have a slabbing and retouching program that, that could hold a candle to this. Look at that. All of that would have had to come out in, in uh, Photoshop and it would have taken me an hour. It wouldn't have taken me an hour. It would have taken Arlen an hour to find Photoshop. All right, so let's see if we can improve these hairs again. You might look at it and say, well, there isn't really any artifact there to worry about. I guarantee you these tools are going to brighten those hairs up and fill them in a bit. Look at that. It's just that subtle, but it makes all the difference. See how it's getting rid of the indistinct fuzzy stuff in the background? And it's brightening up and and making a little bit more color contrast either these I don't know what these are teeth hairs in between these these hairs a place that you wouldn't think of 
to even waste any time. Get your brush down in there and give it a quick going over. You'll be amazed how much sharper your images are going to be. All right, what I'm going to do is, I'm very nearly finished, by the way, with the retouch. This is all I do in retouching. The, the difficult, fancy stuff, that all gets saved to, to Photoshop. I don't waste a lot of time worrying about what I'm doing here because I'm going to clean up any mess when I get to Photoshop. I don't know if those hairs are in the front or in the back, but I'll figure that out too in Photoshop. Let's see if there's anything on the face. Yeah, there is. I forgot this halo. Let's get rid of the, of the halo. Halo is ugly, in my opinion. Sometimes it's very hard to get rid of, but not hair. Um, you'll notice that these hairs, the, one, the bristles or whatever they are in his face, each have their own halo. So look for them and fix them while you're here, because otherwise you might not even see them when you're in Photoshop. The other thing I do is I'll follow these lines. Notice that there's a ridge, there's a ridge there. That that's where artifact gets generated, around structures like that. So I paint around everything. I don't know if that's a nostril or a gash in his face. It's just not a good look for him. Poor beast. This is a face that even the thing's mother must find a little bit repulsive. Okay, check any hairs because see, see what just happened there? You'll grow these hairs just by giving them the once over with the brush. So look for any hairs that you think, oh, that hair doesn't look very good. It must be squashed or lying flat. No, it's probably obscured by halo. And if you just give it a, a paint over, it'll pop back to life. And you can't do, see that one there? Oh, you gotta look quick here because I'm moving like the wind. See how there are hairs standing up and hairs lying down? This is like my hair in the morning. Let's go ahead and get the standing up hairs just in case we can brighten them up any. Uh, where's the others? There's one. Yeah, look at that, it, it just comes back from oblivion. You can just make out where they are. This is probably not really worth it. And I'll show you a trick in Photoshop for making these look better. All right. I think we're about done. Eyes get special attention. They're, uh, they're where your eye is drawn. And if I don't need to go messing around with an eye, I, I generally won't. I'll stay out of the eye itself. It's got to have something I can fix, and I don't think it does. No, it looks pretty good just the way it is. That's it. That's all the retouching. All right. There's our retouched uh, beast. And don't be concerned about all of the filth all over him because we haven't cleaned that up yet, as, as you may have noticed. Okay, we got to save that guy. I don't save anything that I'm not gonna be using again in the future. So I just go to uh, file, save output image, save image, and save it in the same folder it came from. And this also used to take forever, uh, but it doesn't. That's it done. I didn't turn on the machine. It was three seconds, we'll say. All right, um, close the rain stacker. Yeah, I don't want to save any of that work. I've saved the only thing I need and go to library, click on the folder that it was in, go to library again and synchronize folder. And it'll tell me that there are 22 pictures Hang on, weren't there 23? Uh, we hit synchronize, it'll open up all of the pictures plus the one I just retouched. Oh, that's what the other one is. It's one I did last night. Would you like to see it? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll show it to you uh, in a minute. We'll uh, make sure that you are saving the right picture. 
Um, because they're dark, it's easy to make the mistake. So hover over it. And if you don't see the word retouch showing up, don't erase it. I don't need these slabs anymore, so I will erase them. Uh, remove photos, remove from, delete from disk. Means I've got two. That is the uh, little bee that I found in a bottle of alcohol um, last night and shot it. I love this picture. I love the color, very subdued. It's not a good picture because my heater was on and uh, it was very blurry, a lot of motion blur. But still, it's a pretty, pretty creature. Where were we? Um, we were doing this. Now, you're probably thinking, gosh, that is just too dark. Well, at this point it is, but it's now stacked. So before we go to Photoshop, let's do a little bit of um, exposure correction. We're just doing it now instead of earlier on. So I'm gonna just bump up the global light just a little bit, dump the highlights just a hair, boost the shadows a little bit. Then I'll use my white slider to move my white point um, to the right to get the kind of uh, brightness I want in the subject. Same with the black. Uh, though normally I'd move the black to the left to darken the blacks, but this is a, a very black looking chat. Got some clipping down here. You can see the the where it's clipping. I don't care about that. I mean, it is dark in there. Uh, maybe this piece I don't like. Maybe I'll bump up the... Now, the trade-off, by the way, uh, somebody will, will want to know, um, the trade-off of, of shooting way on the left, of exposing way to the left like I do, is um, you, you can accumulate more noise this way. And uh, it's the price you pay. I would rather deal with noise in the shadows than a single specular highlight. I hate specularity. It just ruins the, the image for me. And there's nothing clipping, so we're good. All right, uh, a little texture. Yeah, this guy's got some skin issues. A little clarity. Sometimes I like it. Sometimes I like it not. Mm, I don't. I don't like to, to, to. You know, this kind of really sharp, glary look is not becoming on an ant. Haze. I love to dehaze because it's such a powerful tool. Be careful though; it, it can darken your image uh, at the bottom end. Okay, vibrance. There is, there's nothing very colorful, so um, except the background. A little bit of vibrance to bring out the red in his teeth hairs. And then I balance that with a little desaturation so it's not so glary. And so, something I always do when I shoot with a colored background is I desaturate my background uh, to, to make it look more pale and washed out. That's kind of what I was trying to get from the background anyway, so that's the way I like it. Uh-huh. And color grading I do at the end. So that's all I'm gonna do at this point. Now we've got to go to Photoshop and clean up. Right click on the thumbnail, go to Edit In, Edit In Photoshop 2022, and Edit Copy. Uh, now, because Photoshop wasn't open, it has to open the program, but it has been, when the program is open, this is instant, and I've never seen that before getting this computer. I mean, it, it instantly opens the, the image in Photoshop, which is amazing. Okay, first thing I do is um, make a copy, and then I'm going to, to work uh, on the copy. And my workflow most of the time for a picture like this, which is fundamentally okay, is first of all to go around and clean up all the rubbish. Almost said a bad word. Uh, so I use the shortcut J uh, to open up the healing brush tool and I go to town and I move fast and I retouch or remove using this uh, content aware fill tool, anything that I don't want in my picture. And it will remove artifact. 
it will remove little booger balls like these, uh, bits of reflection, anything you don't want. Uh, just be careful and watch what it does. See, this is a uh, reflection I don't like the look of and it's removing it. This is a powerful tool and um, yeah, I use it liberally uh, because it does such a good job. I'll only, I don't think this hair looks good there, even if it is in front, which it isn't. I'll remove it. Uh, the bigger the, the, um, I honestly don't like this either. It shouldn't be there. It's I, if it's coming from his face, it shouldn't be that long. So let's put it behind the antenna. There, that looks better already. There shouldn't be a gap in the base of that hair. Either put a gap there using this tool or get rid of the hair. Very powerful, this tool, very powerful. And it's easy if you make a mistake and remove something you didn't mean to, you can just command Z, Z for the English lady that got in touch and said that my accent bothered her. Um, so yeah, command Z and it will undo your errant. There you go, there's a good example. I, I clicked on that and it destroyed the anatomy. So I'll command Z that. I'll zoom in a little bit and uh, see if I can get more selective on it because I still want to get rid of it. Don't know what it is. That was a mistake. I thought I had the clone stamp tool. Look at the, look at the texture of this guy's skin. Now, this scalp, uh, or it's actually not scalp, it's thorax, is going to get special treatment because of all of this haziness up here. I don't know what I'm going to do, but um, I'll do something. Now, you can see that this tool works for structures like this, but notice that I'm removing it between normal bits of anatomy, not trying to remove it all at once, because then it doesn't really know what you're asking to remove. I'm going to replace that because it just doesn't look good. But I'll come back and do that because that that's something that happens in the second stage uh, that I that I clean up with the clone stamp tool. Right now, I just stick with this one tool until I've done all of that. These mandibles are something else to look at. I like the, the blue reflections in some places where it's showing up on top. It doesn't look good underneath. I mean, it shouldn't be reflecting under there. Yeah, that's all I'm going to do with the healing brush tool. I think I've got pretty much everything that I wanted rid of is gone. Do a quick scan, just make sure I didn't miss anything. This is a good time before you move on to the next step is to assess the image and uh, kind of take inventory of what you need to do. Here are the things that we need to do here. We're going to do some clone stamping to get rid of this kind of reflective halo mess. Uh, I am going to paint in some, some substance to these hairs that are only partially visible. Um, I'm going to do something with the rest of this hair because it just looks awful. And then uh, I'm going to clean up this um, artifact along the top edge and either clean this up or get rid of it, back, the background. That's what I'm going to do. So the next, I might even do something with this eye because that is dried alcohol grumus and it doesn't look good. So phase two of my retouch is uh, clone stamp uh, based. All of my garbage removal was on that layer one and uh, I'll use a separate layer um, for uh, my uh, clone stamp tool. S is the clone stamp tool. This is uh, my clone source. This is the most important window in this part of my retouch because, uh, or edit, 
because that is how I change the orientation of my brush and it makes a huge difference. So what I do now is uh, I go around and I change larger areas that I couldn't change with the uh, healing brush tool. So I use the uh, a soft brush so that it doesn't leave sharp edges. If there was one trick I would give you for, for using the clone stamp tool, it is uh, constantly change your origin. Don't select material to use as, a, as your clone stamp source and then just keep using it because whatever pattern it's got is going to repeat. And notice how my, I try to always have my, my stamp move parallel with my source. So I go, I pick up a piece of the skin and then I move parallel so that the changes uh, in light, for example, are going to follow what I'm pasting in there. Uh, there was nastiness here. See all this creamy looking stuff? I didn't see that when we were doing the retouch. Now, here's a trick. See this ridge that's got light on it? It continues down here. If you want to, to make this look realistic, then be on the right side of the ridge when you pick up your material. Like, if I'm going to paint up in there, don't use as a source this dark area over here um follow the follow the contours that that you've been given so as we get into this stuff it'll continue to look normal and natural and it does it for us see because it's taking us out from under the shadow of the the mandible and now that looks just about as normal as you're going to get if you have scales on your face. There you go. I, I really don't like that edge. It's the transparency more than anything else that ruins it. So just by the slightest touch, you can remove that. I'm not gonna remove that dark edge. I'm just gonna lessen the impact of it like that. I'm happy with that. I'm gosh, that's perfect. I would never touch that. Uh, I don't know what that is come running out of his nose. I guess it's normal. I'll leave it there. Hairs, making a hair look realistic. The ones that are shiny and white, I think look bad and I need to darken them. The ones that look dark would actually benefit from a little bit more of the light. So what I'll do is for straight ish hairs i will uh, make a new layer and then i'll do uh, I'll, I'll paint some um, hair color into the prominent hairs so i'll pick a, a, a foreground color that is darkish hair color like that perfect i know it's a good color because it's it's from him and then because i'm not a good drawer and i don't have my tablet on I'll start at the base of the hair, like there. I'll click, and then I will shift click, depending on how long the hair is. And then I'll, I'll go to the bottom and I'll do it again. This allows you to make hairs that are curved, but you don't, you can't see that they're actually um, made of straight lines. So now that here's obvious, what I'll do is I will switch to a foreground color that is, I like this really light yellow color. I'll make the brush half as big as it was and I'll pick, look at the other hairs and say, where is the light stuff? It's really in the middle. So the light part of the hairs is in the core. Okay, that's what I was trying to do. And this technique is surprisingly effective. And you can make the, the lines, uh, the straight lines as short as you want, or as long as you want, and you can go over them as many times as you want. 
So that looks like a brown line right now. It's not very impressive. One trick, cut your brush in half and make one short straight line at the end. And you can do another one even smaller and it'll taper it. Like that, but now what this really needs is, um, so I'm going to put just a little bit of the pale color up the hair too. And one doesn't look real believable, but when you come back and if you make the, the lines cross each other and just get all jumbled up, it looks more believable. Now, what about these hideous ones in the back? We've got to do something here. Let me show you what I would do with these hairs. If it's a, a, a dark hair, I will add dark to, to completely fill it. So B for brush, I'm on the dark, small, dense, say 60, 60. And then I will fill it in with more dark. And I'll do that for all of them. And these are all pretty straight hairs, so uh, I can get away with uh, not a lot of clicks. Okay, so so that I can keep up with what I'm doing, I'll uh, I'll do all the dark first. These hairs are against a fairly stark background, so uh, make your lines even shorter here, so that they look more believable as curves. And then on these white ones, if you can get your dark line at one edge and and kind of keep it at one edge, so I'll 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 do this until I can look at the at the scalp and and it look fairly natural, and then uh, I'll decide what to do with the background. I'm going to take a light brush now. I'm going to make it a little smaller and a little paler. And I am going to add accents to all of the dark hairs. And then I think we'll be done. And then we'll back off and we'll look at this thing and see what we think. And if you, if you can do the steady hand thing, there's nothing more believable than a freehand drawn bit of glimmery light. So what I do to finish up is... Take um, take a dark brush and a light brush and just go around and, and add anything I need to. Then I'll take a, a, a background brush. So what I'll do is I'll take the foreground, I'll pick something from the sky here, and then I'll use exactly the same technique with a slightly larger brush, and I will clean up outside the lines. So anywhere where the, the hair looks scrappy like this, I'll paint in light blue. And you won't be able to see the light blue, it'll just look like background. And, but it'll give the hairs a more believable hair shape. So the last thing I do once I've finished up getting those hairs as good as I'm likely to get them, I grab the blur tool, I put it on uh, darken, strength uh, uh, up around 80 and I make my brush teeny tiny but bigger than a hair and for each hair I just go up and down at one time and what that does is it blends together my my lines as you can see sometimes it takes two passes but the end result is uh, a believable hair with light and dark areas but no abnormal looking lines and that's how I finish it up. So when I'm finished I will flatten the image, I will save the image and that should send it right back over to uh, Lightroom. So we'll go into Lightroom and there it is. It looks good. It's a good photograph. That the only other thing that I might consider doing is sharpening this guy. It doesn't, I'm not convinced it needs it, but let's see what it looks like. So we'll uh, go to edit in, edit in Topaz Sharpen AI. Now this is not a review of this product. Uh, I will be doing one. I just haven't had it long enough to, to really uh, get an opinion. This is the view I usually like to, to use where uh, I, I look at uh, 
side by sides and I'll put it on something with a lot of texture. It's hard to say, they all look pretty good. They all look a bit overly sharp, to be honest. I think I like this one just fine. So if, if that's the one you want, you just click OK and it uh, applies it. That does make a difference. I like it, I like it. So if you're serious about your macro photography, you really need to be using uh, a macro one chip in your computer. Uh, I'm making some DIY ones, chips. Um, don't know if they'll work yet, but if you want to reserve one, uh, let me know. I'll put your name on it. It's, it'll be expensive. Go buy one of these computers. Your, your life will change. Mine did. I'm smile now. Not all the time. Well, I have smiled twice. Once. Just order one of these computers. I'll call Tim and tell him that you're on the list and that, that you want to get one. Things are heating up. I'll see you in a few days. Take care.